Hello and welcome back. This is Professor Kai again. This is Design for Adoption Part Two. So in Part Two, we are going to talk about why are some innovations not adopted, right? We talked about how important it is for innovations to be adopted for them to be useful. Because if nobody uses engineering design, it's not very impactful, right? So for this part, we are going to talk about well, what happens when innovations go bad and people don't adopt it, right? So from a design thinking perspective, we already talked about we want to be, as designers, we want to be at the center of feasibility, viability, and desirability. We want to think, we want to think about technology, we want to think about business, and we want to think about people. All right, so what happens when innovations reject it? Well, it could be not business viable, right? This is not good. Or it could be, it's not desired by people. This is also not good. These are two major reasons that innovations don't work, that innovations get rejected by the marketplace and by people. Right, so give some examples. This is the, a smart toaster made by Griffin. Um, it's a $100 toaster. It is Bluetooth enabled, it connects to your phone. There's a real question, though, of why would we ever need a smart toaster? Because in, in most cases, the toaster interface is pretty optimal. You press a button down, and, uh, and the bread goes in, and you have a knob that, uh, that sets the, the how toasty you want it, and that's really it, right? So this is a very obvious case of disconnect between the design and what people really need, want and need. Right, and this is now a discontinued product because, well, no one bought it. And uh, this is a different example, and it's an interesting example of, of let's say, questionable usefulness. Right, this, this is a smart glove, and it's actually a really cool piece of technology that's able to translate sign language to text. Right, it's a very impressive technology, and the problem for this particular technology is that, well, we can just write. In, uh, in most people that are able to use sign language, because it's especially ASL is based on English, so they are likely to be literate, so they can write and or type or text, right? So they are actually more easily accessible and mature technologies such as typing and texting that uh, that leaves no room for this particular smart glove, right? I should make a point that. Perhaps there is a significant use for this kind of technology in the research space, right? We are talking about really in the market space. So this technology, this impressive technology could be the basis for a lot of other technology that could be um, very useful. But in the marketplace currently, we don't see a market for it because, well, it, there's a misalignment, right? So remember, the idea that we want you to really remember engineering design has no impact and no one uses it, right? It doesn't matter how awesome the technology is. And this is a mistake that many, well, many engineers make, right? And we have a term for it called technology push. So the idea of technology push is that we're focusing on how cool or how awesome or how amazing a new technology is, and we develop a product based on that. But that product, if it's coming from, if the design is coming from technology, the technology is pushing us towards a particular design, we're likely to uh, neglect viability and desirability. So that's not good, right? When we're missing both, this is definitely not gonna get adopted. There is a better place to be, right? Alternative to a technology push is called market pull. And the idea is that when there is clear market needs and desire, and these market needs and desire drive product design. This is when we talk about problem formulation in your design project, this is why we spend so much time in problem formulation. And, uh, and why it's in fact iterative throughout the process, we need to think about is our product aligned with the need and desire of the market, right? This is typically a better place to be and uh, we do need to make sure that what the product we want to design is technologically feasible. That tends to be less of an issue though. Um, and when market is driving, when we say market, really we're talking about people's desirability for a product and the 
business viability of product, right? When the market is driving design development, it's a much easier place to be as a designer, right? It, we spent less time designing product that's not going to get adopted and, and essentially having no impact, right? So these one, one way for low desirability is called disconnect. And these two examples, the on the smart glove and the smart toaster are clear disconnects. It's disconnect between design and the context of design, right? How it's used and uh, the, the, the social and cultural environment that exists in people's habits, right? How do people eat breakfast, for example, right? And how do people talk to each other? That, that's, that's, that's the context. Disconnect between the design and the need, right? Is there a need for a smart toaster? Is there a need for a smart glove when I just can just text on full? Probably not so much, right? And really what this disconnect is asking us to do is do better with the problem formulation phase. Now, there is a second part that's called a second way, uh, second thing that generates low desirability is called resistance, right? Resistance really come from the idea that people don't like change. So if an innovation requires significant change to the norm, whether this is the norm of my experience of eating toaster or the norm of how I fit in society, how I dress, how I talk. And if it's going to create too much disruption, people don't adopt it, right? You, people will only go over that resistance when something is so valuable. So we have to actually make sure people see the value is bigger. What we offer in our product, the value of our product is more than uh, the resistance that we have, right? So there's other emotional reasons for resisting innovation as well. It could be things like fear of embarrassment, right? If you want someone to wear something that's really embarrassing, even though it serves a function, no one's going to do it. Uh, or something that really make you stand out in a way that's not really necessarily, uh, well, doesn't make you comfortable, right? So there, that discomfort, once again, is that value going to be bigger than discomfort, right? And put a picture, if you remember, Google Glass comes to mind, right? When you have smart glasses and you start looking like a cyborg, and uh, then very few people actually adopt it. It doesn't offer enough value for people to adopt for the discomfort that it brings to people, right? Resistance come from human psychology and, uh, and, and really the psychology of individual humans and uh, human being as a group. So a good example is actually hearing aids, right? It's a well-known example of relatively low adoption despite high usefulness because it really impacts people's life, right? It's extremely useful, but there's some common complaints is it's too visible. Right? And, and there's a lot of negative cultural judgment that's associated with having hearing aids. And, and in fact, one of the, this is a picture of a, uh, an older gentleman here. And, uh, and that's one of the cultural judgment we tend to associate age with hearing loss, which is not necessarily true. Right? A lot of people can benefit from hearing aids because of this judgment. And let's make it very clear here, it's not fair. Right? The, the judgment here are completely unfair and, and it's not a, we talked about ethics in 1101, right? There's a lot of ethical challenges I will personally have with the cultural judgment around hearing aids, but this is also the reality of the market, right? We, we, we are people, we understand, we think about these things. Now, the newer hearing aids are much smaller, right? They fit inside the ear canal. They're, they're, they're typically Bluetooth enabled and, uh, and, uh, and it looks like that. You can barely see it, right? It's by be much less visible. These newer hearing aids with better technology should lead to increased market adoption, right? So think about, so to end this part and before we start the th third video, the third part, Think about an example of an engineering design that was not adopted. We all know some example of this. Think about an example and then think why was, ask yourself the question, why was this engineering design not adopted? Because that question of why is very uh, educational, is very instructive for us as designers because, you know, if we know why something didn't work, we can avoid that. And, uh, and that's something we really want you to do is to avoid what doesn't work. All right, so with that, I'll see you soon in part three.